Hello everyone. Welcome to the second lecture of the sixth module, which is on sequential circuit design. In the last lecture, we discussed about static timing analysis. We saw that we were using a D register, which was an edge triggered register, and we saw that you know it was storing the system state, right? And then that register has a very important role to play in the sequential circuits. So in this lecture, we will be looking at some of the ways in which we can realize those registers, right? So disclaimers remain the same. Let us discuss about circuit elements which show this kind of memory behavior or which can store the system state. So there are two kinds of circuit elements, depending upon you know, their variation with time or uh, depending upon their nature. So one of them is static memory. So in static memory, similar to you know your uh, combinational circuit design, like you had static CMOS design and you had a dynamic design. So here also, even with memories or registers, we have two kinds of design. One is static design, where we use positive feedback or regenerative properties to realize these registers. However, it is energy efficient only if the content is not updated regularly. If the content is updated regularly, then you have a lot of power dissipation, right? So static memories are energy efficient as long as the contents are not updated regularly. For instance, this boot time configuration data. Whenever you turn on your computer, it loads this boot time data, right? And this boot time data doesn't change much unless you are changing it by, you know, going into the boot settings. So this is kind of data where, you know, static memories would be, you know, efficient when, when they are being used. Now, how can you realize this static memory? Using positive feedback. So what are the positive feedback elements which are available in circuits? So we have multi-vibrator circuit. And in multi-vibrator circuit also, we have different flavors. Most common of them is a bistable element. So what exactly is a bistable element? As the name suggests, it consists of two stable states, which can be classified as logic level zero or logic level one, or which can be used to store a logic level zero or logic level one. It can have several metastable states, but it has got only two stable states. And apart from this, we also have monostable and astable circuits, which are used for different purpose. For instance, uh, like ring oscillator or something. I'll be discussing about these two elements as well towards the end of this module. Now, once we have discussed about the static memory, let us look, look about look at the dynamic memory. Similar to you know uh, the combinational circuit discussion, even here the dynamic memory stores data for a short time as you know charges on a parasitic capacitor. Now, since the data leaks soon, I mean because of the you know uh, we already uh, discussed that there are several charge leakage mechanisms, right? So typically the storage time on those like you know parasitic nodes or high impedance nodes is some millisecond. And since it's some millisecond, we have to update them regularly. And dynamic memory is particularly best when we are using, uh, when they are being used for systems in which they are not continuous. Now, we know that you know there are several problems like charge leakage, because of those leakage currents through sub-threshold current or you know, diode leakages, as well as there's this charge sharing problem. Whenever we are working with this high impedance node or internal load capacitances, there would be these problems. And there would be crosstalk as well as other problems. But how we can handle this problem? Now, since the data is stored as you know, charge on that high impedance node or that internal capacitor or any capacitor in general. So when you have these problems of charge leakage and charge sharing, then in order to you know maintain the state of the data, in order to read the correct data, maintain the state of the correct data, you have to do what? You have to refresh it periodically. Why? Because you need to compensate. I mean, you need to make the data, you need to retain the data in its correct form. So you have to periodically refresh it and you have to compensate in order to compensate for the charge leakage and charge sharing problem, right? And as we discussed, even for combinational circuit design, even when you use dynamic design for realizing these registers, it's a simpler and faster approach. And also the power dissipation is less. At the same time, it is useful for storing clogged data. I mean, the thing is, if it is not being updated regularly, or if it is not being clogged regularly or refreshed regularly, then you'll lose the data, right? So there's this problem. See, refresh actually adds to a lot of power dissipation here. But if you just consider the power dissipation of the individual dynamic cell or dynamic register, that is low. So here I would like to point that out. So refreshing it consumes a lot of energy. However, if you talk only about that dynamic register, its power dissipation is less. I mean, standalone, its power dissipation is less. But if you talk about this refresh process, then 
that takes a lot of energy and that will be you know evident when we discuss about you know even uh, you know the memories like dynamic ram and static ram so on i mean s ram d ram and so on and we discuss that after this module that will become very clear so at this time you just remember that dynamic rams or uh, sorry dynamic memory is actually better as compared to static memory when we have you know uh, when you are storing a clock data that is changing at every cycle and if the data is not changing much for example if it's a boot time configuration data it's not changing much then static memory is something which is more efficient and these are the two ways of designing your registers now you know even i was pretty much when i was speaking in the last lecture sometimes i use black sometimes i use register but there is a difference between the two and in this lecture i would clarify the difference see sequential circuits whenever it is being clocked and whenever you are talking about switching or you know sampling at the clock edge it's a register right latch is a different thing so let us discuss what exactly is latch so latch is nothing but a level sensitive circuit so in latch you know we told that the data is sampled in a register only at the clock edge however that is not true for a latch in a latch it's a level sensitive circuit so let us see what are the different types of latch there is a positive latch and a negative latch so as long as if it's a positive latch as long as the data is as long as the clock is high that is the clock is at logic level 1 whatever data is there at d which is its input it will be transferred to q or the latch is transparent whenever the clock is at logic level high right so latch is something which is transparent at only a particular logic level of clock if it is transparent for positive or logic 1 of clock it is called a positive latch if it is transparent for negative or i would say lo uh, like logic level 0 of the clock it's called a negative latch so this is how you define a latch as long as the data is like as long as the clock is high for positive latch d is transferred to q as long as the data is present or as long as uh, the clock is logic level 0 for negative latch d is transferred to q this latch is transparent so for positive latch or transparent high this is another name for positive latch transparent high d is passed to q as long as clock is high now what happens when the clock gets to low here when the clock gets to low whatever data was there immediately before this it's stored it's held it doesn't change so whatever was the value of this d immediately before this edge when the clock was high that is retained when the data is or when the clock is logic level 0 so logic level 1 for positive latch d is transferred to q logic level 0 the data is held what data is held the data which was sampled immediately before this clock edge similarly for negative latch everything is complementary it's a dual of it, right now let us talk about registers what are registers so registers are basically edge driven the sample input only at clock transitions so here i told that as long as clock is high or clock is low depending upon whether it's a positive latch or a negative latch d is continuously sampled to q but in registers that's not the case d is sampled to q only at clock transitions so if it is a 0 to 1 transition i mean if it's low to high transition if the data is being sampled at low to high transition of a register it's called a positive edge trigger register and if it is being sampled at high to low transition or 1 to 0 transition of the clock then it's called a negative edge trigger register now how are these registers constructed so typically you know they are constructed using these latches itself and they use this master slave configuration so whenever you discuss about sequential circuit you hear this term a lot master slave architecture and even for your placements they will definitely ask you master slave latch based flip flops i mean not definitely but it's a very common question in nearly all the interviews they'll ask they'll first ask you master slave configuration then they'll ask you uh, you know setup hold time and then they'll try to make complex network of them and then ask you to calculate setup hold time or you know whether the uh, or the maximum clock period or something like that so be prepared regarding that right so what exactly is master slave or master slave architecture so it's the most common architecture to construct registers with latches so what we do is we cascade two complementary latches if we cascade a positive latch followed by a negative latch it's a negative edge trigger register if we cascade a negative master with a positive like if we cascade a negative latch as master and positive latch as slave then it's a positive edge trigger register if we cascade a positive latch as master followed by negative latch as slave then it's a negative edge trigger register 
Now, you know, there's a huge discrepancy in the definition of this register and latches in the literature or in even books. There are different definitions given in the books, in the literature and so on. But in this course, we would be following the convention which is like, you know, stated in the Rabai's book. And that simply says that register is any element, any storage element, which is edge trigger. How exactly is latch defined? So latch is any level sensitive device. And what is a flip-flop? So I was using register and flip-flop invariably, right? That is true in some sense, but you should know that, when, you know, the way Rabai defines it is, flip-flop is any bistable element, right? But what we are looking ahead or what we'll be working with is a register. So whatever we have, we are saying that flip-flop is actually in the sense of register. Any bistable element, we can call a flip-flop, but you know, uh, in the last lecture, I used register and flip-flops invariably. That is fine to some extent. But from now onwards, we will refer registers as any edge ticket storage element and flip-flop as any bistable element. Right? So now we have been talking about this bistable element for a long time. That you know it's a basic component, it's the most common way of implementing static memories. Let us look at a very simple form of a bistable element. So I told that you know static memories use this positive feedback to realize bistable elements. But what exactly is bistable? That also we discussed that it's any circuit having two stable states that may represent logic level zero and logic level one. Let us see a very simple form of bistable element, which is obtained by connecting two inverters and then taking, taking a feedback from output of this to the input of the first. So here you can see that we have V in one. I mean, the uh, input is at V in one. It goes to V out one. Now V out one is actually input of the inverter two. So V in two is nothing but V out one. And because of this feedback, this V out two becomes input of inverter one, right? So V in one is V out two. Now let us look at the VTC of these CMOS inverters. So you remember from our discussion in static CMOS module that you know this is somewhat the like this is how the VTC of a CMOS inverter looks like. So this is V in one versus V out one. That is VTC of inverter one. This is VTC of inverter two. That is V in two as a function of V out two. But now you know we see that you know this input. I mean this input of two is actually output of one, and this output of two is actually input of one. So there is a possibility. <clears throat> that you know we can represent it on the same axis similar to the load line analysis right so there is a possibility that we can represent them on the same axis let us choose that same axis as v out one which is equals to v in two sorry yeah v out one which is equals to v in two and v in one which is equals to v out two so if we want to represent this on this axis similar to finding the load line why do we find load line? So as to you know, find out the possible, uh, you know, uh, possible operating points, right? So if v in two is given input, I mean, so v in one is what? V in one is nothing but v out two. So we want to express this v out two here. I mean, we want to bring this axis here. So if you do that, it's simply obtained as flipping of this along this direction. So if you just flip the axis here of this curve, because you want V out two on the X axis, right? V in one is supposed to be out two and you want that in, on the X axis in order to find the possible operating points. So how can we do that? So let us plot V in two, which is nothing but V out one on the Y axis. And, in, and correspondingly, let us draw V out two on X axis. So then V in two is large. What is the value of V out two? It's zero. When V in two is small or when V in two is zero, what is the value of V out two? It's one, right? So this is nothing but, you know, access, this is simply, you know, rotation of this. And we have simply transformed the axis, like we have simply made or plotted V in two on the Y axis and V out two on the X axis. Why have we done that? Because V in two is V out one, V out two is V in one. And we want to, you know, make the axis same so as to, do the load line analysis and find out the possible operating points of this circuit, right? So once we have done that, what do we do? We just superimpose them, right? So once we superimpose them, what do we find out? That this is the characteristics of inverter one. This is the characteristics of inverter two. So we look for the intersection points, right? So we find out that there are these three intersection points, A, B, and C. Now, if 
gain of inverter is larger than one. That is, if the gain in the transition region it's larger than one, then A and B are the only stable points, and C is a metastable point. Why do why do I say so? Right? I say so because let's say if there is a noise in the system, let's say we have biased the system at this present point C or metastable point C, and let's say if there is a noise in the system, let's say the noise actually deviates the C like noise is present in the system. And it deviates it towards left, given by this blue arrow, right? So it if it deviates it towards left, now what is our input then? So C is typically at VDD by two, right? Now if it's deviated towards you know less than VDD by two, what is our V in one? It is less than VDD by two. So if V in one is less than VDD by two, if V in one is less than VDD by two, we get the output V out one here, right? V in less than VDD by two, we get V out V out one here. Now this V out one is what this V out one is actually V in two. That is, this this point actually this voltage actually is input to the second inverter. So if this in, if this voltage is input to this inverter, the output will lie on this line, right? So corresponding to this voltage as input, corresponding to this V in two as the input to the second inverter, the output that you get here, out two that you get here is this, right? At this voltage, see, I don't know if it is making sense to you guys or not, but let's talk about this C point. Noise deviated it, like it was we biased the system at VDD by two. Always there would be some noise. It deviated it towards the left. Noise amplitude is negative, and the RMS value is negative. We deviated it towards the left. Now, since it's deviated towards the left, now what is our V in one? V in one is less than VDD by two. V in one less than VDD by two. What is V out one? We follow this curve. We get that V out one is this. Now this V out one is what it's the input of this inverter. So this voltage is actually this voltage here. This voltage here. This is the voltage. This is V out one, right? This is the input to this inverter. And what is the characteristics of this inverter? It's this in this transformed axis. So corresponding to this as the input, what is the value that we are getting? Or let me tell you like this: corresponding to this input, corresponding to this V in two as the input. Intersection with this curve is on, like intersection with this curve is at this point. So corresponding to this value of V in two, we are getting V out two as this point. And now corresponding to this point as V out two, like this point is now the input of the first inverter. So corresponding to this point as V out two or V in one, what is the corresponding V out one that we are getting? It's this one. We we'll look at the intersection with this line. Okay. So a small deviation here. Is actually amplified and regenerated. So, small deviation in the noise gets amplified and regenerated, and we reach either point A or point B depending upon the noise direction. Similarly, if the noise was positive, so our system stable, like our present point would be, you know, now V D D by two. If it is shifted by noise from V D D by two, it would be greater than V D D by V D D by two. So, if V in one is now more than V D D by two, what is What is the value that we get? If V in one is more than V D by two, if V in one is more than V D by two, if it is shifted here, then corresponding to this voltage, what is the V out one? This is the V out one, right? This is the value of V out one because we'll look at the intersection of this intersection on this axis. For this value of input, because of noise, what is the value of V out one? It's this. Now, what is this V out one? This is input of two, right? This is this value. This is input of two. Now, if this is the input of two, what is the output? We'll look at the intersection at this. So, from here to here, we'll draw a line, and it intersects at this point, at point, you know, at this point. So, this now becomes what? This becomes V out two, and this voltage is what? This is input of the first inverter. So, how will we get the output of the first inverter? If this input is applied to the first inverter, what is the output? We look at the intersection with this axis, and it is here. So, we get to point B. So any noise or any deviation from point C, which is definitely going to happen because noise is inevitable in a system, it will get amplified and regenerated around the loop, and then system will go from C to either point A or point B. So these are the stable states, bi-stable states, because loop gain, or I would say the gain at these points, at points A and B, is smaller than one, whereas the loop gain at point C is quite larger than one. Right? That is true. So this is a bi-stable element, a very simple bi-stable element.
Now, how can we change the state of this bistable element of flip flop? How can we make it toggle? There are basically two ways. One is to overpower this circuit by making loop gain larger than one at A or B. So A or B are stable points, right? Where the loop gain is less than one. In order to transition or in order for transition to happen, you must make the loop gain larger than one at either point A or B at the stable states. So how can we do that? If we apply a trigger pulse, then we can make that. Now, how exactly we apply a trigger pulse? So let's say this is our bistable element. We have a large transistor. Why we make this MOSFET larger? Because you know, if this MOSFET is not larger, then we cannot overpower this. If the driving strength of this is not larger, we cannot overpower this. So this is also kind of ratio logic, right? However, let me not go into the details. I'll go into the details when I'll be discussing about SRAMs, static RAMs in the next module, which is heavily used in the cache memory. You know that cache memory is the most expensive memory. Larger the amount of cache memory, more expensive your system is. So cache memory is very important. And this is the system which is used in cache memories. So it's very important, right? It's understanding this is very important for you guys. Also, it's also very important from placement perspective. So it would be better for you guys to read it well. Now, what I say here is that width has to be larger than the total delay along the loop. So what I'm saying that, you know, let's say the system was stable at, let's say, point A. So what is point A? Point A means what? Point A means B in one is zero. B in one is zero. B out one is what? B out one is one. B in one zero. B out one one. B in two is one. And B out two is zero. Right? Let's say we are at point A where B in one is zero. Let's say we are at point A, B in one is zero. Now we want to transform it to point B. What is at point B? So at point B, your B in one is equals to one. B out one is equals to zero. B in two is equals to zero. And B out two is equals to one, right? So we want to flip from point A where B in one is zero to point B where B in one is one. So what we do, if it is at point A, that is if this B in one is zero, we apply input as VDD. And we apply enable signal as VDD plus VT so that whole VDD is passed because otherwise it will pass VT minus VT, right? So let's apply that and then let's try to flip this volt. I mean, let us try to overpower this volt. Now, why I say that, you know, width has to be larger than total delay around the loop because let's say if I apply this signal for only one propagation delay. So if I apply this signal for only one propagation delay, this is one for one dp. That is, this node will get one. So this node will get what? After one dp, this is transferred here, right? So this node is one, this node will be zero. However, this node earlier was at logic level zero. So if this signal is now removed, this node will try to force this node again back to logic level zero, right? So this feedback actually forces it again to logic level zero. If this input signal is applied only for TP or only for duration, which is less than TP. The signal, this signal actually doesn't propagate and come back here. It doesn't reinforce the feedback. So there is a competition between feedback and this input signal. If the applied signal width is less than the total delay around the loop. Now let's see what happens if we are apply this signal for more than 2TP. So if we apply one here for more than 2TP, this one is transferred to zero at end of 1TP. And this zero is transferred to one at the end of 2TP. And then this feedback is also sending one here. So even if you remove the input now, feedback is one and this node is also earlier at one because of the previous input applied. So this feedback is reinforcing it. There's no competition between the feedback and the applied input, right? So this input has to be applied for a width or for a duration, which is more than the total delay around the loop. So that feedback also reinforces it and it doesn't compete with it, right? So this is one way of changing the state of flip flop. There's another way as well. And that is most common. I mean, in embedded system, embedded memories, that is very common. What is it? We cut the feedback loop. So we just remove a feedback loop, write the correct data, and then reconnect. How can we do that? Simple way to do that is to introduce a pass transistor in the feedback, right? If there's a pass transistor in between, just by the control signal, we can cut the we can you know cut the feedback loop. Then we can insert another signal and write the data, and then we can reconnect it by just applying the control signal on the pass transistor. So this is most commonly used in multiplexer-based latch. And that is most common in your embedded memory. What exactly is embedded memory? 
So the memory which is closest to the processor, that is called embedded memory. Somewhat far is cache, and then apart from farther from that is your main memory. So registers, registers that are present in your uh, processor that are these much space matches. Then cache memory that is present that is static RAM. Then what is the main memory? Main memory is your dynamic RAM or DRAM. And then what is HDD or your solid state drive? That is your flash memory. So these are different hierarchies of memory in your computer system, right? And we'll be looking at all of them in the next module. So don't worry. This much spaced latch is most common for registers, embedded registers, and this is how we do it. I mean, we just break the feedback, and then you know we we can do that by introducing a pass transistor. So now let us look at this much spaced latch. How exactly it is constructed? What is its importance, or how it works, and so on. So this diagram shows you basically two different types of much spaced latch. One is a positive latch, and one is negative latch. It is obtained by simply you know using this feedback. Using this feedback to holding the data, right? So this feedback is basically this feedback basically ensures that the data is held when the clock is, you know, the opposite way. So latches we told that you know, if it's a positive latch, then when clock is one, whatever data is at D, it should be sampled at Q. It should be transparent, right? So whenever your clock is one, D is equals to Q. This is when feedback is broken. I mean, there's no feed, like this feedback is not in the path, right? Clock is equal to one, this is selected. When clock is zero, this feedback ensures that whatever queue is there, it is held. So when clock is zero, what happens? What value of whatever value is here, this will be transferred to queue. And since it's fed here, whatever value of queue was earlier there, it will be again fed to queue and it will be held here as long as clock is equals to zero. So how do we write it? We write by making clock equals to one. This multiplexer chooses this input and transfers it to Q. How do we hold it or how do we read it? When we apply clock signal equals to zero, what happens? This positive feedback path is chosen. And what it does is whatever value of Q was there, the same value is sampled here again and again as, as such, it is held. Similarly for the negative latch, we just change the, you know, pins on which we apply D and the feedback loop. So when the clock is zero, what happens when the clock is zero, the input is chosen and this gets transferred to Q and then it's right. Feedback is broken actually or feedback is not used. Instead of writing feedback is broken, feedback is not used in that sense. And when clock is one, what happens? The positive feedback is restored. Whatever was the value of Q here, that is kind of feeding again to the max and then coming out here because this is a transparent path when clock is one. For a negative image, right? So this is how one can realize a latch based on mux. Now we, like you know, discussed in uh, the previous combinational circuit design module that these muxes can be realized efficiently using using what? Using these transmission gate based logic, right? So let us see how we can realize this positive latch using this transparent or uh, using this transmission gate logic. So this is the MUX, right? You remember that this is the MUX. But here you see additional inverters as well, right? Here you see some inverters. Why are these inverters used? So these inverters are used so as to enable the regenerative problem. I told that you know these transmission gates are not regenerative, so there would be problem of finite rise and fall times, and those will degrade as you propagate along the chain. However, if you have these static CMOS circuits together with this, or these regenerative circuits, your rise and fall times will be within a particular error limit, right? Your signals would be regenerated every time, right? So that's the reason why we use these inverters. So now let us look at, you know, uh, its operation. So let us look at this positive latch. So for positive latch, clock is equals to one, D should be transferred to Q. So clock is one, this transmission gate is open, this is closed, or this is on, this is off. So whatever value is here, it will be transferred through this transmission gate, to this queue. And because of these two inverters, basically non-inverted version of D will be present at Q. D will be inverted here and then back inverted to original phase at the end of this, right? So output is basically Q. Output is basically D itself without any inversion. Now what happens when the clock is zero? So when the clock is zero, this feedback loop, loop is reinforced. How? 
Because if clock is zero, then this is turned off. If this is turned off and this is turned on, whatever value of Q was there, it will follow this path. It will be inverted. It will pass through this transmission gate. Again, it will invert and come back to Q. So then it is pulled, right? So for clock equals to one, feedback is not in the path and D is transferred to Q. For clock equals to zero, this feedback is turned on and whatever value was here, it's coming back via this feedback loop again here. So it's held, right? And the best part about this circuit is sizing is not critical, right? Sizing is not critical in transmission gate. It's or you can always use the minimum size MOSFETs. Second advantage is that these inverters have been used, so we don't have to worry about signal regeneration or you know the rise and fall times. Also, since these CMOS inverters have been used, input impedance at point D is high and output impedance here is low because it's at the output of CMOS inverter, right? So you remember that number of fan ins or number of fan outs that we can drive depends upon this input impedance and output impedance, and we require high input impedance at the input and low output impedance at the output, right? And this is satisfied. However, the problem with this kind of approach is that dynamic power dissipation is high, clock power dissipation is high, and also there is only one clock signal which is driving these different, you know, transmission gates. So if you talk about, you know, let's say the clock and clock bar are generated by, it is, let's say that the same system is generating that clock and clock bar both. So to that system, there's a load of four transmission gates, right? Four MOSFETs, sorry, not four transmission gates. So the clock has to drive this transistor, this PMOS and this MOS, and the clock bar has to drive this PMOS and this MOS. So typically if it is being sent by the same system, that system has to drive four MOSFETs. So number of MOSFETs that a clock drives, that is also a performance metric. And by clock, I mean the clock system, clock and clock bar together. Here we have a load of four MOSFETs to a clock signal. Also, if the clock is being sent to, or that system is actually supplying this clock to four points, then routing will also be complex, right? And since the clock is switching every time, dynamic power dissipation is also high on those four modes. So these are a few problems with, you know, transmission gate-based latch implementation. However, we can go for another simplified design or we can reduce this clock load by going for a pass transistor based latch. So let us look at what exactly is a pass transistor based latch. So in pass transistor based latch also, when the clock is zero, if we talk about positive latch, if the clock is one, then what happens? Clock is one, this path is on and D is transferred to Q, right? Path is like, if clock is zero, this is turned off and whatever value of Q was here, since clock is zero, this is turned on and the feedback path is on. And this will be, you know, this will be reinforced through this feedback. So it works as, you know, it works as a latch that we can say for sure. However, we remember what was the problem with pass transistor. There is a degradation of logic one. If B is one, what would be passed here? If B is one, what would be passed? It would be VDD minus VTH. So if B, if B is one, clock is one, VDD minus VTH as it at this, at this node. Now at the input of at the input of CMOS inverter, if there is VDD minus VTH, if the maximum input here is VDD minus VTH, what is the minimum VGS drop or what is the minimum VGS across the PMOS? Minimum VGS drop is VSG. Let's talk about VSG. So if the maximum voltage at the input or the gate of this you know, CMOS inverter is VDD minus VTH, and let's assume VDD at VTH of N is equal to VTH of P, what is the minimum VSG? VSG is what? VDD minus this gate input, right? So VDD minus this gate input, if maximum value here is VDD minus VTH, what is the minimum VSG? Minimum VSG that we can get here is VTH. So VTH N is equal to VTHP. So we can say that because of this pass transistor based implementation, the PMOS of this CMOS inverter is never turned off. If the PMOS is never turned off, there is always a path between VDD and the ground, right? So if that is the case, there would be significant static power dissipation, which I told that was a problem for pass transistor even before. But now we have reinforced that and we have told that clearly. And you know, the worst part is, this VDD minus VTH is reducing significantly, especially for modern MOSFETs. So let me give you a case study. So VDD is already 0.7 volts for seven nanometer, and it is going to be 0.65 nanometers for the future technology needs. So if VDD is 0.7, we can reduce the VTH proportionately 
in order to get a large VDT minus VTH. But that is not the case. Why that is not the case? Because VTH has already reached its limits. It cannot be reduced further. So what are the parameters on this threshold voltage depends on? Threshold voltage depends upon oxide thickness and the channel doping. Lesser the channel doping, higher, like lesser the channel doping, lesser the threshold voltage. Why? Because what is threshold voltage? Amount of voltage, amount of gate voltage required to produce an inversion layer with a concentration equal to the background concentration. If the background concentration or the effective channel doping is smaller, at a lower gate voltage itself, you'll achieve that kind of inversion layer concentration, right? So if channel is less lightly doped, your threshold voltage is less. Also, if the oxide thickness is small, your gate electric, like your effective capacitance or effective field effect. So effective electric field, electric field is what? It's basically voltage divided by, uh, you know, the thickness. If the thickness of the oxide is small, then the electric field is large and your field effect is large, right? The ability of the gate to control the channel is large and hence whatever, like, inversion layer concentration was dependent upon what? Cox times effective VGS minus VTS, right? Sorry, inversion, yeah, inversion layer concentration was dependent upon Cox times then overdrive voltage. So, if your th oxide thickness is small, then what happens? Your Cox is large. Or let me give you the physical significance. If the oxide thickness is small, then large number of field lines can penetrate through this oxide and invert the channel. Okay? Since large number of electric fields can penetrate the oxide layer and invert the channel, or if the electric field is large, even at a smaller voltage, then inversion layer can be achieved at a smaller voltage. So, VTH can be reduced by reducing oxide thickness and reducing the channel layer. However, in FinFix itself, the oxide thickness is close to one nanometer. That, will, that too, by using IK, like IK data electrics, it's already reached its fundamental limits. I mean, 0.65 angstrom is, you know, size of atoms. So if it is one nanometer, 10 angstroms, then it's, all, it's already, like, has already reached its limits. So oxide thickness, effectively, oxide thickness of one nanometers are being used in effects. And the channel is undoped. Considering both these cases, we cannot reduce them further. Or if you reduce them further, there would be significant problems with leakage. So we don't want to do that as well. So this is the limitation. The fabrication process, all it has advanced, but VTH cannot be reduced further because oxide thickness has reached its limits. Channel is already undoped. There's no doping. I mean, doping concentration is close to 10 power 14. It's not intrinsic concentration, 10 power 11, but it's not 10 power 10, but it's, uh, you know, undoped, 10 power 14 or something. Right? So these are the reasons why we cannot reduce the VTH further. But if we want to make circuits at ultra low VDD, let's say 0.7 volts, 0.5 volts, and if the VTH is large, let's say 0.3 volts or 0.4 volts, you only get an overdrive of 0.1 volts to 0.2 volts, which is very small. Your current will be very small. But circuit designers have to find a way beyond that, right? So at device level, it is not possible to reduce it further. But is there a way to reduce it further? Yes, there is. So there is this method which circuit designers use, and in which what they do is they forward bias the source body and drain body junction. Now this may appear irrelevant to you because so far academia or even I have always taught you that you should never forward bias the body junction. It is true, it makes the system unreliable, but under, you know, circumstances under these circumstances so people say that you know uh, something like you know uh, you know something is mother of all invention yeah necessity is mother of all inventions so this invention came out of necessity this was first done at intel in 2004 itself i mean this is not a new technique since 90 so it was first proposed in 1996 Intel came up with a 0.5 VDD circuit using forward biasing of body junction in 2004. And since then, it has been a common practice. It's not like, you know, you cannot forward bias the source body or dead body junction. We teach you not to do that just because it makes the system unreliable. You're not sure whether the CMOS latch up will occur or whether your device will burn. You don't know that. But typically, the modern uh, MOSFET technology can sustain some amount of forward bias, right? So, I am telling something to you which may appear that, you know, your whole life was a lie-like thing because uh, we never tell you to, you know, 
followed by as the body junction, but this is a common practice in the industry. And let me tell you that for 180 nanometer technology, which Intel used for the first time in 2004, they applied a 250 millivolts of forward bias, not even 5 to 10 millivolts, 250 millivolts, 0.25 volts of forward bias of body to source junction and body to brain junction. And it led to 50 millivolts reduction in BTH. You can understand that this is such high voltage, such a high forward bias voltage. And even then, it led to only a small reduction in the BTH. Increasing VTH is fine, you just reverse bias the body junction. But reducing the VTH, this is again a technique not really not appreciated in academia. Not even, you know, everyone will tell that it will make the system reliable. It's true, it makes the system unreliable, but it's used in the industry. So you should understand that. I mean, you should nothing is you know absolutely good or absolutely bad. Depending upon the necessity, depending upon the constraints. You should know these tricks and then you should apply them. And this is actually thinking out of the box. Whole world, while the whole world was thinking that, you know, you should never forward bias this, people came up with reliable circuits by forward bias. Okay. So this is one of the things that I would like to encourage. Uh, think critically, think out of the box. Never, you know, shy away from doing these random things. Sometimes they work and who knows. Many of these Nobel Prizes were, you know, not planned or they came out erroneously because of erroneous experiments. So, you should never shy away from doing these, you know, uh, random things. Okay. But you should be careful about the consequences. Right? Okay. So, with this discussion, now let me talk about the master-slave configuration of realizing a register. So, as I told that, you know, you have to complement, like you have to cascade complementary latches in order to realize a register in a master slave configuration. So if you cascade a negative master and a positive slave, you realize a positive H3 register, which is the case over here. Here we have a negative latch, which is the master, and it is cascaded with a positive latch. How it is cascaded? So the output of the negative latch, QM, is fed as the input of the positive latch. Right? So output of the first negative latch or master latch is fed to the input of the slave latch. And this is the final output of the register. So this whole system is the register. It is fed by one clock. D is the input of the register. Q is the output of the register. However, intermediate node is QM, which is actually the output of this master latch and input of this slave latch. If this is negative master and positive slave, it's H positive H trigger register. How? Let us see that. So as long as the clock is high, D is transferred to QM, right? And if the clock is high, then what happens? Whatever value of Q was there, it is held, right? Because if clock is one, oh, sorry, sorry. I have gone the wrong way. So let us discuss the case when the clock is zero. So if it's a positive h trigger register, it samples only when the clock goes from zero to one, right? Only when the clock makes a transition from zero to one, this latch, Trans, like this latch samples the D and sends it to Q, right? Oh, I'm again confusing you guys. So let me tell it again. So this is a positive H triggered register, not a latch. So in a positive H triggered register, whenever the clock makes a transition from zero to one, what will happen? This D would be sampled and it will be transferred to Q. Okay. So let us take that case. So when the clock is zero, so when the clock is zero, what happens? When the clock is zero, this D is transferred to QM. This latch is transferred. So this D, whatever this D is, this is transferred to QM, right? D and QM are same. Now, the moment this clock goes high, the moment this clock goes high, this QM is in hold mode, right? The QM goes in the hold mode. And what happens to the second positive latch? So when the clock was zero, what is what was the case of this Q? When the clock was zero, it was in the feedback mode. It was in the hold mode. Whatever value of Q was there, it remained there. Right? So when the clock is zero, whatever value of Q was there, it remained there. Whatever value of D was there, it was being latched to QM or it was transparently being transferred to QM. Right? Now when the clock goes one, from zero to one, when the clock goes one, what happens? QM goes into the hold mode. Whatever value of QM was there, 
just before this positive edge of the that will be stored. What about this positive latch? Whatever value of QM was there immediately before this positive edge, immediately, immediately before this clock goes high, that will be sampled to Q. So what is exactly happening? Whatever value of D was there immediately before this clock edge, that is being transferred to QM. And whatever value of QM was there immediately before that clock edge is being transferred to Q. So at this pause edge or this positive edge of the register, what happens? Whatever value of D was there, it was kind of sampled to Q eventually, right? So this is what happens. Okay. Now let us talk about a positive, like a register with positive master and negative slave. A negative slave. So if there is a register with positive master and negative slave, then it's a negative edge to get risk. So here, what was happening? When clock is low, master is transparent, and D passes to QM. Right? When the and the slave is in hold state. This is in the hold state, right? And retains the previous value of Q. Now the moment this clock goes to one, what happens? Master goes to the hold mode, and whatever value of D was sampled immediately before this at QM, that is now sampled by the slave, and whatever value of QM that was sampled before this clock edge, which was actually the value of D, which was sampled before the clock edge, goes to Q. It passes to Q, and this QM is held at this master, master latch, right? And now, what is the best part of this? Since QM is held stable, even when the clock is high, QM is continuously being transmitted to Q. That is, this is transparent as long as the clock is high. So QM is continuously being reflected at Q. But since this QM is in the hold mode, since this master is in the hold mode, the value of QM doesn't change and we are getting a stable output at Q, right? So this is the advantage. This ensures that Q is making only one transition or Q is stable throughout this, whenever this clock is one, this Q is stable. That is what it simply means. That is what it ensures. Otherwise, if this were not in the hold mode, if D was like even being sampled to QM, then Q will also toggle based on D. But here, what is happening? When clock was zero, D was sampled here. Now, when the clock is one, this goes in the hold mode. So whatever value was sampled, it remains here. And it is continuously being shown or it is continuously being transferred to this Q, right? So by this, we ensure that, you know, Q is the value of D immediately before the rising clock. And that is how, you know, a positive edge trigger register is constructed using this master slave configuration. Okay, so with that, now let me talk about this uh, transmission gate based master slave configuration. We have a negative latch followed by a positive latch. So this is the out, this is the input of this register. This is the output of this register. However, in between we have two latches. So input of this latch is D, which is the input of the overall register. Its intermediate output is QM. And then this QM is the input of this other latch. And this Q is the final output, which is again, the final output of your overall register. Now, what happens exactly? Let us look at the operation. Clock is equals to one. What, is, what happens when clock is, so what happens when clock is zero? When clock is zero, this transmission gate is turned on. This is turned off. Clock is zero. This is turned off. This is turned on. Value of D is sample at QM. Similarly here, when clock is zero, this is turned on. This is turned off. So Q is in the hold mode. Now, when clock goes from zero to one, the moment is goes from zero to one, this is turned off. This is turned on. So whatever value of QM is there, it retains here. It is in the hold mode. And whatever value of QM is here, since it's in hold mode, it's not changing. So whatever value of QM is there, when the clock goes one, it gets transmitted here. And clock is one, this is off. And as such, this feedback path is not on when clock is one. So immediately, like, so immediately when the clock goes from zero to one, whatever value of D was sampled at QM, immediately before the uh, like positive edge, that is held here and it is continuously transmitted here, right? This is how it operates. That is how you get a positive edge trigger resistor. Now there are several timing definitions, right? That we discussed in the last lecture. One of them was setup time, which is time before the positive clock edge that the data must be valid. So this is your data. We have to find the time before the positive clock edge that the data must be valid. So 
this simply means that before this positive edge of the clock, this D should have arrived at node Q1, right? D should have arrived. So after the clock edge comes, then what happens? This is simply transmitted. The value which is available at QM, this is simply being transferred to Q, right? So setup time simply means that before the clock edge, before the clock edge, positive clock edge, what should happen? D should be available at QM. So what is the delay for D to be available at QM? What is the time that it takes for D to be available at QM? It's simply, it passes through this inverter, then this transmission gate and through this inverter. So it's TP inverter one plus TP transmission gate one plus TP inverter three. This is the time it takes for this signal to come here. But you may think that, you know, this is sufficient, but it's not. Why? Because when the clock is one, we have this feedback loop also turned on. So we know that, you know, if this, we know that the feedback should reinforce whatever is the correct value. It should not compete with it and switch it. So whatever is the value of this, so whatever is the value of this D, it should be available here also. Then only the inputs at both end of this transmission gate will be same when clock goes to one. Think about this in the following way. If this is the value of D and the value that is present here is something else. The moment clock goes to one, this value will be transmitted through this transmission gate and it may switch this value of QM, which was, which has to be held, right? Which has to be kept stable. So this feedback should also reinforce the same value of D, which was sampled to QM. What I'm trying to say is, let me repeat again. D reached here and now the clock went to one. When clock went to one, this transmission gate turns on and this feedback loop is also turned on. If the value of voltages present at this node and this node are not same, what I mean to say is if the value of D, which is available here and here are not same. Again, uh, let me not go by that. Let me explain it the other way. D is available at QM after delay of this inverter plus this transmission gate plus this input. Now, now let's say that this node is something different and it has not been updated, right? We have not given it enough time. We have not given enough setup time for this D value here to propagate through this inverter also and reach here. If that is the case, if the value at this node is different as compared to this, what would happen? The moment clock is turned on, this feedback loop will try to enforce this data onto this node. However, we want that the value which was sampled at QM, that itself should remain there. To ensure that what we do is, we also wait for some time, or we also include this delay of inverted two, so that what happens? This data goes from, this goes from this inverter to this transmission gate to this inverter three to QM. And then it also comes back at this point. If it comes at this point, if we add this delay of inverter two, if we give it enough time so that it comes here, that is if we add the delay of inverter two also, then the voltages at the two ends of this transmission gate, they are the same. The voltages at the two ends of the transmission gate, at the two nodes of the trans two ends of the transmission gate, they are same. And then the feedback will reinforce QM when clock goes high. It won't compete with QM. So, we also include this TP inverter of two when we are calculating the setup time. So as to re so as to make sure that when clock goes high, this feedback is reinforcing this QM and it is not competing with them. It is not trying to change it. And if it's not the case, if we don't include that, then I2 and I3 may settle that incorrect value and you know, feedback may reinforce a different value, which we don't want. Then what is the point of even having a setup time? Right? if we are not able to you know, ensure that correct data is available. Right? Now, the second important point is the register delay. Now, register delay, whatever value is here, what is register delay? Whatever value is sampled here, it should reach Q, right? And the propagation delay for this input, for the sample input to reach Q, that is exactly your register delay. Now, the best part about this is, since we have included this I2, since we have given a sufficient time for this input signal to pass through I2, 
since these are kind of you know same inverters i mean these are uh, identical inverters so by the time this d input reaches this node through i2 it also reaches this node here right so in one inverter delay this d input which is here it will reach this point as well as this point so now the delay that will that will be there for propagation of this register for propagation of this signal d when the clock edge arrives that is tc to q will be only this transmission gate delay plus this inverter delay why because this i4 is kind of already included i mean the data already passed this i4 when we included i2 in your uh, setup d is available here in one propagation delay it will reach here as well as here i mean in this path it will reach here after one propagation delay in this path it will reach here after one propagation delay so data is already available here before the rising edge of clock setup time is that itself right because time before positive clock is that the data must be valid so data is already valid here before the clock edge and now once the clock edge comes clock to queue delay simply delay of this transmission gate three plus delay of this inverter right so tc queue is here simply delay of this inverter plus delay of this transmission gate also let us talk about the whole time so when clock is equals to 1 when clock is equals to 1 this transmission gate is turned off so when clock is equals to 1 qm is held stable d is not at all or the input to this register is not at all reflected at qm or q so there is no point of you know in like there is no point of uh, i would say enforcing any constraint on d to have its data stable after clock has become zero or after clock has become 1 so what is whole time whole time is the time for which the input must be stable before or after the clock edge so now the clock has become 1 this transmission gate has turned off qm is stable and it is continuously being fed to q so even if the input changes it is not being transmitted to qm so why do we want to you know hold the value of d for some time after the clock edge we don't want that so even with a hold of whole time of 0 we can work with this sir right and set up time time before the clock is that the data must be valid so any value at d takes this time to settle at qm so if you, only if you apply d or only if you keep this d stable for this propagation delay time or the time given by setup that can you expect qm to be stable when the clock edge comes right so that is the setup time okay however this ensures that this whole time constraint of zero this ensures or this is valid only when there is no one one or zero zero overlap in clock and clock bar so so far we assume that the same system is generating clock and clock bar but there can be different ways i mean there can be different ways of generating clock bar you can use an inverter when you use an inverter there is a delay and there can be overlap between clock and clock bar and that leads to some kind of problem and this key hold becomes important in that case it depends upon the overlap even and then this t hold equals to zero no longer is valid and in the next lecture we shall see how we can generate clock and clock bar reliably which are non overlapping and what is the problem that comes when we have overlapping design of these clocks and another problem with this kind of circuit is you see eight mosfets are being fed with this clock so the clock load is actually very high. i mean the clock and clock bar the system it's feeding eight mosfets together so clock load is high and that is one of the problems with this kind of circuit